Very warm welcome to everybody to this series of early childhood lectures. Today's lecture is the first of a few that are upcoming uh, and organized by our university, the Singapore University of Social Sciences. So a warm welcome again. I would like to give a quick introduction to our guest speaker, Professor Iram Siraj, um, before I hand over the time to her. Uh, towards the end of the session, we will have question and answers. Um, I would uh, really encourage everybody to unmute themselves and speak up and interact with our guest. Uh, otherwise, we have also prepared a Slido question and answer platform. Uh, we will send you the QR code later on at the end of the lecture. Okay, so for now, uh, I'll say a little bit about Professor Iram Siraj. Uh, in case uh, some of you are new to her, she has an international reputation and expertise for longitudinal research and policy. She has co-directed a number of world first, very influential studies for policymaking. And these include the effective provision of preschool, primary and secondary education, FC. Um, there's also a very transformative uh, study called the researching of effective pedagogy in the early years, repeat. And we also are very interested to learn more about the effective leadership in the early years sector study. She has co-investigated with the Australians effective early educational experiences in Australia. And her recent studies do focus a lot on professional development interventions looking at the impact of evidence-based professional development in Australia, the UK, and Norway. Leadership in Early Education, the British Academy grant to study the development of refugee preschoolers in Malaysia, as well as an EEF math intervention in 106 primary schools to improve math for four to six-year-olds in the UK. She was also technical advisor to the OECD's IELS International Pilot Study on Wellbeing, Advising on Child Measures. She has three very widely used quality rating scales in the cognitive, social, emotional, and physical domains. So without wasting more time, a warm welcome to Professor Iram Siraj. Professor Siraj, the time is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, colleagues and friends. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Cyrene Lim and the Singapore University of Social Sciences for inviting me to uh, contribute to uh, this public lecture series. Um, in recent years, uh, governments have recognize the importance of early development and a lot of my talk is around that and um, they have opened up uh, preschools to um, birth to six-year-olds uh, to help them to prepare for life in school and more generally. So today I'm, I, we're, we're quite convinced that we should provide preschool education but I think there are some questions over what kind of preschool education and uh, what kind of um, preschool education, early education is considered of high quality and why it's important and how we can measure it. So I'm taking evidence from my research and that of other colleagues to go through this with you today. So in terms of our own research, Cyrene mentioned the effective preschool primary and secondary education study, which was a 17 year longitudinal study conducted with my um, uh, statistical and psychological colleagues uh, about uh, the long term impacts of preschool primary and secondary on children's outcomes. You can see from this study that we had uh, over 3,000 children from 141 preschools in England, and we assessed them at the beginning of preschool, at the end of preschool, and then also at, when they were 
6, 7, uh, 10, 11, 14 and 16. So it's a substantial investment by the Department for Education in England to look at um, what is the impact of, of, of uh, preschool on, on children's learning as they go through the learning life course in schools. And we did look at all our different types of um, uh, preschools. And here are the assessments from ages three to 11, because we're looking at early years. I haven't put it all the way through to 16 or 18. And you can see that we managed to get information on children's cognitive and social behavioral development. We managed to get information on uh, the home learning environment. And then later when the children were old enough, seven onwards, we got self-report from the children too. We also measured the quality and characteristics of preschools and primary schools. And we also have um, uh, teacher observations, teacher reports, uh, observations of classroom quality and Ofsted judgments. And Ofsted is our um, uh, school inspectorate. So there are many influences on children's outcomes at different ages. And we uh, have assessments for our children at five, seven, 11 and 16, national assessments, or we did in those days. And for our own assessments, we tested for English and maths, but also social behavioral outcomes, such as a child's ability to self-regulate, whether they were pro-social or not, or whether they, they were showing, showing any antisocial behaviors like hyperactivity. And we, with, with those measures, we conducted um, a good statistical uh, analyses where we fed in child factors, we tried to control for things like gender, age, um, English as an additional language, family factors such as uh, parents' education income, home learning environment, whether it was low, medium or high, because we'd measured it, preschool quality, whether it was low, medium or high, and then later also primary schools. And what did we find? Um, you know, it's hard to encapsulate five, five years research and then 17 years research in uh, individual slides, but these are the take home messages from the first five years of the research. We found that if children come from disadvantaged backgrounds and they are at risk of social problems, then high quality preschool makes an important contribution to improving their social development especially boys, because we tend to find more boys in that category in the English context. And children with no preschool experience, we had a controlled home group, had poorer attainment cognitively uh, in terms of social development and self-regulation, even after we'd taken account of their home background. So even middle-class children who had preschool did better than middle-class children who didn't. Even working-class children who had preschool as a group compared to those who didn't, did better. And more terms in preschool, especially after the age of two, is related to better cognitive and social progress. That's what we call the dose effect, how much of preschool you get, almost like an intervention. And children who attended preschool settings part-time half-time, developed as well as those that um, attended full-time. But we didn't disaggregate this. It might be that disadvantaged children do much better if they have full-time, but we didn't look at that. So I want to um, look at how early childhood education and care experiences long influence long-term outcomes and the wealth of nations, because I think uh, as governments spend more and more on public tax money on uh, early years, the public are asking questions about this investment. And we know that early experience, um, education and global competence are interconnected. Uh, we know that um, our country's success and capabilities are uh, uh, rest on investments in education for the population. So people accept the schools are important, so they pay for schools. 
However, what happens before formal schooling, we think is also very important because it shapes children's lives throughout their development. And early experiences affect um, people's lives, including their future educational attainment, their social emotional development, their employability, even their criminality and mental and physical health. And these factors affect the global competence of the population and hence the success of the nation. Yesterday, I was in a meeting with the World Bank. We've just put together a very interesting book on um, nurturing children's uh, early learning and potential. And the, even the World Bank was saying that they had increased the funding in the last 10 years to early years from 500 million annually to 1 billion. So there is a international world imperative to invest in early years. And why is that? So it's the links between socioeconomic status and development. So here we're looking at income quintiles. This is the lowest income and the blue, the green is the lowest income and the top quintile, the top 20% is the highest income. And you can even see that school readiness at age three increases with the income that parents have. So even by the age of three, some children have a very disadvantaged start to um, <coughs> their learning. Vocabulary at age three has a similar pattern as at age five, and it's a reverse pattern for conduct problems and hyperactivity. And these are important markers of later social problems, mental health problems, uh, criminality, and so on. And you can see that the lower the income the families have, the harder it is for them to support their children in uh, more positive ways. So the OECD says that about 20%, this is the more wealthier countries, even in those countries like Singapore, still a substantial minority of children don't achieve basic minimal skills for functioning in a modern society. And currently around 20% of children enter school with some developmental problems. And disadvantaged children are five times more likely to have low literacy. Now, this is not just a problem for parents and the individuals. Of course, in terms of uh, moral imperatives, we want every individual to fulfill their potential, but it's also a problem for society. So one in three disadvantaged children start school with poor language skills, and that is actually quite hard then to fix. So disadvantaged groups, as we've said, have poorer health, poorer social attention, lang uh, language and cognitive um, uh, outcomes, which makes them at greater risk as uh, people in terms of fulfilling their life potential. That's not to say that some middle class children don't have these problems as well. These are group effects. And it's not to say that working class children can't achieve because many do. These are group effects. And the effects on literacy, numeracy, health, employability, adjustment are profound. So early skills beget later skills. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about human capital production, uh, later skills at school, employment, family, parenting um, are really dependent upon these very early skills. And it's passed on from generation to generation. Our government is very keen on how we break cycles of depriva deprivation so that um, all human beings can get a fair chance to succeed. And for most of our children, if parents or homes are unable to give those skills, the second chance they get in life is when they enter preschool. And Singapore is lucky enough to have a pretty good comprehensive preschool system. That doesn't mean it couldn't be better, but it does have more um, preschool than most countries. And there are greater benefits from investment in early years than later on. And that's been 
you know, shown by James Heckman, who's a, a Nobel uh, Prize winning economist. But we know that the impact of poverty on children is persistent. And early experience is critical in this link because the interactions we have with children drive development. So there are two arguments for investing in early childhood. The first is our moral duty to optimize our population's well-being. And the second is economic. We all benefit in the long term. So early risk factors relate to poor outcomes like, uh, as I've said, poor learning, school failure, unemployment, antisocial behavior, substance abuse, and health issues. And why should we focus on early childhood? Well, there are three strands that show us why. First of all, we have a psychology department here at the University of Oxford, which is doing amazing work on neuroscience. And we're showing the importance of early brain development is critical. And I will show you why in a minute. And also developmental science. We know that when you are faced with risk factors, you can put up um, protective factors that can mitigate against the effects of risk factors. So one of those is high quality early childhood education, and that can act as a protective factor against risks, improving children's life chances. And of course, there are those in society who are concerned about the economics. High quality early childhood education, even though it's expensive because ratios are different and because we've not invested in early years, it can save significant amounts of money over time. And we know that early childhood contributes to creating the population workforce that's needed in the 21st century, both for um, uh, social skills, intellectual skills, but also for moral skills, for harmony and social cohesion. We in Europe are seeing high levels of intolerance, uh, even war at the moment, and much of that comes from um, poor understandings of uh, how humanity should behave. And so here we've got some postnatal development of the human uh, cerebral con context. And you can see from birth to two years, there, is, there are millions of synapses connecting every second, every minute, every hour. And look at the development of the brain in those first two years, it's phenomenal. And from the age of about three, four, it starts pruning. So the bits that aren't used get lost. And by six years, those that are used frequently are retained. And I'll tell you why this is important because I will go on to some other slides to show that. This slide is showing the sensitive period uh, and, and uh, synaptic uh, development. You can see here, that we've got from zero months to three, six, nine months to one year. And then we move quickly to four, eight, 12 and 16 years. And you can see how rapidly um, vision, hearing, uh, language develops in the first six months to nine months to one year. And then how quickly it develops and continues to develop up to the age of four. And I often um, joke that, uh, you know, um, children's brain development is so huge, they need to use lots of calories on their, on their brain. And that's a fact. I mean, as adults, we use 20% of our calories on our brain. At the age of four, children are using 60% of their calorie intake on their brain. And I think that tells us something about children's early development. So you can see why um, pr professors like myself and Cyrene Lim are so concerned about what happens to children before the age of six, but particularly also before the age of four, and how physical, social, emotional, and cognitive development are inextricably linked. So, in particular, I want to talk a little bit about children's language environment and how language development 
underpins cognitive, educational and social development. So we're trying to develop maths at the moment for four to six year olds. But if a child doesn't understand what's being said, it's very difficult to develop that maths. We're trying to develop scientific thinking in children. If a child doesn't understand uh, scientific words and concepts, they will not make progress. We're trying to teach children manners and to be tolerant and share and to tell us how they feel if, if they don't want to do those things. If they don't have the language, they can't tell us. A child with poor language skills at three is at risk unless an intervention is undertaken. And this is the unfairness of society. This is the quantity of words heard by a child in a typical hour when they are um, under three uh, and over three. So you've got a child whose parents are on welfare, working class, and then professional. And you can see it ranges from just over 500 words to over 2000 words an hour. And within that, it's not just the quantity of words, just like it's not the quantity of preschool, it's also the quality, the quality of the words heard in a typical hour. In more middle-class families, you have more affirmations, approvals of what the child is doing. You know, that's right, darling, move it forward. Um, that's it, you've got two chairs. Oh, well done, you've picked that up. So those kinds of language are less common in children from poorer backgrounds. Not always, remember these are group patterns, not individuals, and obviously some people are doing it, but it's not just the quantity of language, but the quality of it. And that also includes the complexity in grammar and the rare density words that adults are using with children. And words heard in four years. So by the time children are four, and they're just, you know, in the years before primary school, there are already children who have only heard 12 million words in their four-year-old life, whereas others have heard over 42 million words. This creates a huge disparity in vocabulary, in understanding, in cognitive development, and all the other areas I've talked about. Okay, I'm going to take you back to the research now and to preschools. So I've tried to establish why early childhood education is important, what are the developmental issues, and what are the developmental risks. Now I want to talk about, and that sits a lot with families, but now I want to talk about how we can ameliorate some of those risks through pre preschool attendance and quality provision. So from our research, we're just going to take one outcome, which is predicted emergent literacy to begin with, to help us to understand that. So most of you will be thinking, how on earth do they measure quality? How do they know it's high quality or medium quality or low quality? Well, we do have standardized measures. And in our uh, study at the turn of the century, we used some uh, rating scales that measure quality. And here are the two we used. So they measure quality in language and math, science, diversity, and also in terms of environmental things like space and furnishings, care routines, and so on. And these are validated and they're used to uh, measure quality. Uh, the researchers have to be very highly trained. They have to be reliable and uh, they give numerical values to quality from inadequate one to excellent. So we can use these in our statistical models to look at the quality of education uh, in centres. So here's an example of one. A researcher might use this item um, on literacy development. Uh, and this is about um, uh, the book corner and the book area. And you can see minimal would-be books are unattractive and or not of suitable age. And then minimal would be some books of different kinds are available, easily accessible, and some reading takes place in the book corner. 
And good would be there's a variety of types of books and they're used independently by the children outside group reading times. And excellent would be the area is comfortable. It's filled with a wide range of books of many levels of complexity. So it deals with all the children. The adults plan for and encourage children to use books and direct them to the book area. And books are included in learning areas outside of the book corner. And here's one for science. I'll only go through the top line because I haven't got the time. No preparation. This is science, food preparation. So this is like a little bit of um, chemistry, I suppose. No preparation of food or drink is undertaken in front of the children. Minimal would be it is undertaken. Some children choose to participate and, and there's some discussion. Good would be uh, the activities for cooking are provided regularly. Most of the children participate, staff lead discussions, and they encourage children to use their senses to explore raw ingredients. An excellent would be a variety of cooking activities in which all children take part regularly. The ingredients are attractive and the end result is edible and appreciated. Staff encourage and lead discussion on food preparation and or question children about it. For example, um, the chocolate was hard when we put it, when we heated it, what's happened to it now? And the children can talk about the fact that it has changed to a liquid. So now that in physics, we would call that changing state of matter. We don't need to say that to small children, but they can see that when heat is applied or taken away or when coolness is applied, things can turn into solids or liquid. And that is a very fundamental scientific concept uh, later in life. So we measured quality, but we also looked at, um, uh, sorry, I've got to go back, um, duration and uh, the quantity of preschool. So children who went to preschool for one or two years, as they do did in our country at that time, from the age of uh, three to four, or those who were there two to three years from the age of two to uh, five, you can see the amount of preschool makes a difference. The more they had, uh, the more months they gained in early reading. So you can see that this is low quality preschool. This is medium and this is high quality going for just one or two years. And it's still, it adds three to five months to children's re pre-reading age. But the high quality uh, um, is always better, even when there's low duration. But high duration overall is better and it's better to have higher quality. And it's the same at the age of 11, at the end of primary school, we're still seeing a preschool quality effect. If children went to low quality, which of course isn't bad quality, we're not talking about inadequate, and we're zeroing here for the home children who have not had any preschool. So there's a little bit of added uh, at the low quality end, but it's the high quality end that adds to English and maths achievement, even at age 11 of the preschool quality. So I now want to look at the effects of global quality, which was things like care routines and so on. Um, uh, th there wasn't much effect of um, uh, good care on English or maths at 11, but it, there was an effect on social and behavioral outcomes. So for instance, in both the more academic quality and the more social behavioral quality, we saw where there was high quality, um, self-regulation was better. Self-regulation is basically children's ability to control their impulses, to share, to maybe listen when somebody is talking to them and uh, carry out conversations. So here we have uh, higher self-regulation um, with higher quality and lower self-regulation, almost the same as just being at home uh, with uh, for some children. And the same is true of antisocial behaviors at 11. Having more antisocial behaviors is bad. Um, uh, so we've got um, high quality. If it lowers antisocial behaviors, that's a good thing. 
if they remain high, that's a bad thing. So here we've got uh, lower antisocial behaviors where we've had the high quality. And our social development, those when children started school, we saw again, compared to the home children, the preschool children who had been in higher quality settings, had better cooperation, better independence and concentration and better peer sociability. And here we have um, children's reading at age seven compared to social class and attendance. These are our national assessments at age seven. That's the expected minimum. And you can see that the no preschool group did worse than the preschool group, regardless of whether they were children of professional skilled or un-semi-skilled uh, families. And the same with um, uh, the preschool quality and social behavioral outcomes, medium and high quality had better outcomes. Now, the good news is the preschool helps everybody. Uh, the bad news is it doesn't close the gap. The bad news is that the bottom 20% are not ready for school. Whereas the bottom 20% who go to preschool are ready for the challenges of um, uh, upper primary. And uh, that's a really, really interesting finding. And that self-regulation, which underpins um, control and thinking is higher in children who went to higher quality. And this is now at age 11 in literacy and numeracy. Blue is numeracy and red is literacy. And we can see the normal things that have a big impact uh, that we've known about for decades, mother's education, family income. Uh, but look at this, this is high quality pre, uh, preschool, having quite a big impact still at the end of primary. And although they've had six years of primary education, the impact of the primary school is about the same. And the home learning environment, what the parents do with the children is very powerful. Now this worries me about countries like Singapore, where you have a high um, employment of maids and helpers within homes that often have poorer uh, language skills and uh, home learning environment than perhaps the parents might. And you might find that that has an impact on your population. We don't have uh, much home help at all in England, it's what the parents and families do. So this needs to be looked at very carefully because you have to remember that when children are in preschool, they're really spending about a maximum of 20% of their life in preschool. 80% is still over 80% at home. So what happens in the home is still very powerful. If your children go full time, maybe you're spending 30%, 35% in preschool, still the majority is in the home. And here we have preschool quality and self-regulation and pro-social behavior. Again, high quality. The pattern's the same throughout. And even at age 16, look at this, at age 16, Pre, pre, high preschool quality is still having an impact throughout the secondary years. Obviously, secondary school has an impact too, and primary school still impacts on maths, uh, uh, but the increase in language is, I'm not really sure why not there. I mean, obviously there is an increase in language, but um, it's, it's not adding more. Uh, and again, home learning environment is still there, as is mother's and now father's education, but also um, uh, income and so on. Another interesting finding is not just the academics, but the relational pedagogy. And this might be something that's um, very relevant to uh, a, a, a country that has a more Confucian culture. The quality of relational pedagogy is how uh, children feel loved and secure and able to ask questions and be open and get things wrong. And here we've looked at, uh, we've basically measured the staff. Do they have positive relationships with the children? 
or are they punitive, that is over controlling, or are they permissive, you know, just let anything go on, you know, drinking coffee while the children are fighting, or are they detached, don't take an interest in the children, maybe um, uh, being around but not uh, engaging with them. And many people think, well, these care type of things don't make a difference. You can be punitive and children can learn. But that learning might not be as good as you think, and it wouldn't be as long lasting. And here we've got the evidence from our preschools that if you have positive relationships, which the majority of our staff did, the, the, you know, the, the graphs were skewed towards positivity, but we did have some uh, staff that were more punitive or permissive or detached. And you can see we've got statistically significant findings in early reading, number, independence, cooperation, and peer sociability, and only negative, statistically negative findings in terms of child outcomes there. Okay, so the summary, early years shapes future development, preschooling, Early childhood education and care is vital to a successful society. High quality preschool boosts outcomes. Disadvantaged children experience poorer quality education across phases. Um, some people have done studies in Singapore and other countries which show this is replicated, not just in terms of uh, poorer children going to poorer preschools, but also maybe when you do additional tutoring poorer families hiring uh, poorer tutoring. So it, it goes through the system. And we found that the maintained sector in our country that was run by the government had better leadership, more qualified staff, and was probably better positioned to drive up quality improvements, particularly for disadvantaged children, because we've invested quite a lot in Ministry of Education, nursery schools, in and children's centres in poorer areas. And that we need much more work on pedagogy assessment and uh, the workforce to strengthen quality. So we haven't got there yet. So what does quality look like? What do we have to take into account? We have to take into account the workforce, graduate level nurses best, uh, practice, but then you've got to have high quality uh, staff coming into the graduates and quite often we find even in countries where most early childhood educators are graduates we find that the, the applicants have lower uh, school results and um, they're paid less and they don't have parity with their primary peers. We also need a content and environment in which uh, there is a curriculum and challenging and play-based learning and then we also need to train people through either continuous professional development or initial training or both ideally to have clear educational goals, meet individual needs. I'll say a bit more about sustained shared thinking, it's process quality, high levels of interaction, warm responsive relationships, we've just talked about that, and parents involved in their children's learning, not in a didactic rote learning way, but in a supportive, nurturing way. So we found that our home learning environment, some of you might be thinking they found the home learning environment was important. What bits of the home learning environment are important? We asked lots of things about computer use, about bedtimes, but these were the things that came out as powerful. Reading to your child. These were linear relationships. The more you read, the better it was parents or family members who read to their child several times a day, the children had better language and reading, who allowed their children to paint and draw more, went to the library more, or played and taught letters and numbers, especially through games where there's turn-taking and sharing, and where the children learned songs, poems, and nursery rhymes, and they were sung together. And here we, we see that our children did um, benefit from self-regulation, but it was often mediated through other things. It's what we call a disposition. So to be aware of your own thoughts, to be uh, able to share, you've actually got to uh, work with teachers who are allowing you to explore, who are modeling 
self-regulation. And self-regulation is important because it helps with literacy and numeracy. But where did we find it? In high quality and effective settings. By effective, we mean they add it to children's development and by a better home learning environment. So people often think about self-regulation as largely being about, you know, emotional things like, um, you know, waiting to take their turn. But it's also cognitive, the child's ability to persist with different difficult tasks um, and uh, waiting for their turn. I mean, children often model, they speak, don't they? Like, you know, if they're waiting for their turn to go on a trampoline, um, you know, I'm a long way from the front, aren't I? And then when they're next, they say, I'm going to be next, aren't I? So children speak through their self-regulation and adults can help them with that third person kind of speaking uh, to help them control those emotions and that thinking. And of course, behavioral as well. So what are we concerned with? We, we want um, to change the workforce. We want them to have more intentionality as we've shown in our scales that recognizes where adults recognize children's agency and their autonomy and try to increase it and develop it and their sociability and their concentration. So Bob Pianta talks about it as directed designs intera designed interactions between children and teachers in which teachers purposefully challenge, scaffold and extend children's skills. And I would add thinking. I would also say that this is a good definition of process quality. Structural quality is things like qualifications, ratios, the kind of building you've got. Process quality is what happens between the minds of children and adults on a day-to-day -day interactional basis. To assist that, we've produced a family of UK, European, Chinese, what we call clickers, which stands for Curriculum Leadership and Interaction Quality Rating Scales. And the Singapore University of Social Sciences under the leadership of Professor Lim are, are using um, at least one of these scales. And these look at the quality. We've looked at one or two items from the ECAZ, the science and the um, book corner one. But then we also have one that came out of our research on social emotional uh, well-being and sustained shared thinking that is high quality interactions we also have one on movement play and because we think the teachers are right when they say we consider the whole child so we couldn't just produce a scale on cognitive or cognitive and social emotional we also had to produce one on on physical um, at the moment, I'm writing one on pedagogical leadership in the early years, which is on uh, leading learning. And um, you can see, you've seen what's in the um, ECAZ before, the STU scale, which came out of our more effective centres that had better outcomes for children. We observed in those centres, we did systematic observations, and then we wrote this scale because the best centres were good at building trust and confidence in children. Uh, seeing to their social and emotional well-being, supporting and extending their language and communication, also their learning and critical thinking, and assessing and learning, uh, uh, learning and language. The focus is on language because you've seen why that is from my earlier PowerPoint. And again, it's heavily focused on interactions. I could quote 2,000 texts here, but I've just put a few up. Children's interactions with their educators and other children, more than any other program feature, can determine what children learn and how they feel about learning. So we want our children to continue to want to learn. And my own research has shown that excellent teachers um, display a very high level pedagogy that we've called sustained shared thinking. It's a little bit like the Harvard Development um, Child Center when they talk about uh, back and forth conversations, but we um, uh, say it's more than that. It's not just back and forth conversations, it's back and forth conversations that uh, are intellectual, 
that help to clarify a concept, evaluate an activity where both people are contributing to the thinking or in the group and it's being extended. I'll show an example of this in a minute. And later when we wrote the stew, we summarized it further and said it's the active engagement of practitioners in children's learning and extending thinking. So sustained shared thinking, um, it can be verbal or nonverbal. I've seen children with Chinese as an additional language or English as an additional language observing an English context or a Chinese context without understanding the language, but learning what's happening because it might be children in the water playing with sponges where when the sponge is full of water, they're saying it's heavy. And then when they squeeze it and the water comes out, they say, now it's lighter. And they're playing and they're learning about um, water having density and so on. And then a child can come in and model the same thing and the adult puts words to it. So it can be verbal and non-verbal. And we would emphasize that there's a contribution to thinking. And the educator may be standing back, intervening, modeling, questioning, offering a provocation. Oh, I don't think you can do that. Yes, I can. And you know, the child wants to show you. And the educator needs to be sensitive, not necessarily um, interrupting and talking. A, a responsive adult who intentionally scaffolds learning. So the school, the, the stew scale again was on the seven points and we had these five areas that I've mentioned before. And you can see that under each of the areas, there are items that can be rated like self-regulation and social development, encouraging choices and independent play, planning for small group work. And then we've got some of these that are quite easy to achieve by teachers. And then we've got harder ones encouraging children to interact with each other. Staff actively listen to children and encourage children to listen to each other um, and so on. And then we've got the other two um, subscales as well with items in them, encouraging sustained shared thinking through story time and investigation and exploration, supporting concept development and higher order thinking. Now we've, we've conducted these um, measures. Here's an example of sustained shared thinking and investigation and exploration. I won't go through it because I've got um, about five minutes, eight minutes left, but I'll just go through the top one. Very little exploration and investigation is encouraged. Minimal would be, remember this is low quality but not bad quality. Staff set out activities and open-ended resources deliberately to encourage exploration. And good would be they encourage the children to use their imagination and creativity to explore and experiment. They encourage children to bring resources, scientific equipment from area to area. So children might be doing a project on mini beasts and this would be setting things out for the children to explore, but this would also be making sure that the children have magnifying glasses, pooters that they can put ladybirds in to look at carefully, and then staff model using scientific problem-solving approaches for the children. They support careful watching, prediction, and anticipation and evaluation through talk and action. So it's a hot day, the children are going to have some ice, um, and, and the staff decide to talk about ice. You know, uh, where does ice come from? And the children say it's water. Oh, it's water, but it's hard. What's happened? Oh, you put it in the freezer and it gets hard. Okay, so what's gonna happen now that we take it out? And then you talk about what would happen if you put it outside in the sunshine? What would happen if you left it inside? What would happen if you put it in the fridge, but not in the freezer compartment? And you could put them out and go and check every 10 minutes what's happening to that ice. <laughs> so you can see the adult is more purposeful, more intentional, teaching language, teaching concepts, teaching words that are helping children to hypothesize, to create fair testing and to monitor and evaluate. And so um, this relies a lot on the teacher's skill and the adult skill could be parents of interactions and questioning. Closed questions are helpful, but we should have more open questions. Our more effective settings ask more open questions 
which stimulate higher order thinking. Now, it's sad to know that 70% of children aged four to six in one study, it's an old study, but a recent study has found similar findings. Conversations are only used for routine business. Can you go and get some papers? Do you need to go to the toilet? Instead of, um, why do you think this happens? So what we want to see is uh, more interactions like this. This is not even a planned teaching. This interaction is called the light up shoes. And this is an example of sustained shared thinking, showing how the process of thinking, hypothesizing, and investigating can occur in any situation. So I haven't picked a fixed situation. I've just picked one situation where uh, a teacher is talking with um, uh, four four-year-olds. And uh, she says, wow, look at your shoes. That's so cool. They light up when you step down. Do you have those trainers, children's trainers that light up when they step down? And the first child said, yes, they do this. And she jumps up and down several times because children always want to show you, don't they? And the teacher says, how does that happen? How does it light up? And the first child says, because they're new. And she says, mm, mine are new too, but they don't light up. Ah, uh, so the child says, oh, another child says they light up because you step down on them and then she steps down on them hard to show again. Teacher steps down hard on hers and she says, thanks, Fanny. Mine don't light up when I step down. So now you've got two counterfactuals from the teacher. She's not uh, undermining their theories, but she's offering counterfactuals. And a third child says, no, 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 no. You have to have these holes the teacher points to the holes in her, home, her own shoe. Third counterfactual coming up. But I have holes and mine still don't light up. And Josh has holes in his trainers too. And his don't light up either. I wonder why. The child says, I think you need batteries. Kids, you need batteries. Yeah, the first child says, you need batteries to make them work. Thinks for a while and then says, but I didn't see batteries when I put my toes in. Child four says, I think they're under the toes. And another child says, I can't feel the batteries under my toes. And the teacher says, I wonder how we can find out about this. And they go on and continue to talk about this indoors because they were outside. So what's happening when there's sustained shared thinking going on? Basically, the characteristics are adults are tuning into children. They're showing genuine interest. They're respecting their decisions and choices. They're inviting them to elaborate. They're recapping, offering their own experience. Children used to love it when I was a teacher and tell them about what I was gonna do at the weekend or how I'd taken my dog for a walk or how my cat was sick and I had to go to the bed. They love hearing your own experiences. Clarifying ideas, suggesting, reminding, encouraging further thinking. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about that? Oh, that's an interesting garage you've made. I wonder where the doors are going to go. Are they going to be big enough for just cars? Are you just doing cars or are you thinking of fixing trucks as well? You know, that kind of taking further. Offering an alternative viewpoint. Uh, do you think Goldilocks was naughty when she ate the porridge? Do you think the bears would have liked her to come and live with them? speculating, reciprocating, asking open questions, modeling, thinking. So how often do we hear early childhood educators or parents saying things like, tell me what you think. Why do you agree? Um, do you think everyone would think the same? Mm, how can we find out? Do you think it was always like this? Tell me more about that. When I think about that, I feel what do you think is going to happen next? So all these questions can come out in science experiments, while you're reading stories with children in dialogic reading, uh, during them making something. I wonder why you put the windows there. What does this do? So moving away from well done, that's beautiful, and ending something to actually stimulating thinking and creativity and curiosity. So 
I've identified a lot of professional development and I've conducted a number of randomized control trials in different parts of the world. We're doing them in Norway, um, Victoria, New South Wales and Australia and England, in um, Ireland and so on. And we looked at um, hundreds of uh, ECASI and STU ratings and we found that teachers were quite good at doing the language and literacy bit but they were not so good, especially at the higher ends of math, science and diversity. They ended to get very low grades there. Now, I know you've got the sparks in Singapore, but it doesn't specifically look at particular uh, areas of the curriculum. And it doesn't actually take um, the teacher's intentionality and relational pedagogy as far or as in a detailed way. The SPARKS is very important to get low quality up, but we also want to extend quality into the more uh, good and outstanding areas. So in terms of um, PD from STU, we found that teachers were actually quite good across uh, Norway, Australia, um, Germany, England, at building trust, confidence and independence and social and emotional well-being but they struggled with the extending language and communication. It required higher order pedagogy and planning. They struggled with learning and critical thinking to get that up to good and excellent. And they were not so good at assessing learning and language. Okay, I'm going to round up now my last slide and say, what, what can we do? Now, Intentional teaching, I, I have visited Singapore schools, I visited Hong Kong schools, I visited schools in Beijing, Shanghai, um, and in Africa and Australia, I'm very lucky. And I think I know what works now, not just from visiting hundreds of preschools, but from reading hundreds of psychology and education texts. I think Singapore teachers are right not to have completely unstructured play without adult support. But where I think maybe Singapore teachers might, some might struggle, is where perhaps they're, they're engaging in too much highly structured, adult directed work with little or no play. We found the children nurtured within, in the middle, not where uh, the, the, the play is totally child-centered, but it's child-centered and child-friendly with adult planning, is where there is some child-initiated play, but the adult support for an enabling environment and sensitive interaction. So the, the children uh, might have play routines that you set up, like the home corner become a dentist or a supermarket, and you've got paper available for them to make lists, you've got uh, appointments books, you've got a mock phone, children can actually uh, play, but you've set up that play routine where the language takes place and so on. And then there's focused learning, adult guided, like the, like the ice activity or the cooking activities or certain maths games that the children are playing where they are, playfully explored and experiential activities, but the adult has focused learning outcomes for the children as well. So uh, that's the end of my, my talk and um, a few references here. I'm happy for um, uh, Professor Lim to make available um, this PowerPoint as a, as a PDF if, um, if anyone uh, requests it. And I'm sorry, I haven't been able to show videos of good practice because I know that I have a very diverse audience and I'm trying to build up the picture. And please forgive me if I've covered things you know already. Thank you very much for hosting me. And I thank all my colleagues at the Singapore University of Social Sciences for allowing that to happen. And I thank you for attending late in the evening where you are. Thank you, Professor Serard. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, I would like to just invite 
of participants to be able to unmute themselves and ask some questions. I think that would be more engaging than just staring at, you know, questions written down. Um, so I'd like to invite you to just speak up for now. Hi, I do have a question. Yes, Arisha, go ahead. So during one of your sharing, um, you said something about most government are focused on how do we break cycle of deprivation. Um, and I do understand that, you know, in, in any society, in any country, even in countries like that, that are affluent, like Singapore, you would have a small fraction of um, um, families that do not have sufficient, um, you know, financial support, or they do not come from families that are, um, that are affluent. Um, so do you think there should be costs for preschool education to relook into how we communicate values such as grit, uh, perseverance, and maybe just you know, illustrate some form of social stories or social experiences where kids could um, go through simulated experiences and then just have just to have a bit more of a conversation on what would you do if you are in this situation or how can you um, ensure that, you know, you do not give up, you do not persevere? Because it seems that um, this form of values are being relegated. Whenever you look at studies, it always an emphasis on, that it has a huge emphasis on language and literacy, numeracy, science. But I feel like, you know, the, the world has shifted up to a certain um, extent where there's not much um, focus on how do we bring forth civic and moral education, for example. Yeah. So maybe if, do you, do you reckon if, if, you know, the preschool sector, we do a bit more emphasis on communicating this kind of experiences, illustrating this kind of experiences, it would help kids who um, grew up in this kind of environment. And that when they leave preschool education, when they go into primary and tertiary, um, and they come, in, they come across such situations, they'll be able to recall, oh, you know, I should not give up. Oh, you know, I should persevere, that kind of stuff. Um, I, I, I don't think the early years is the only place in which we can have interventions and support children. I think there are very successful interventions later on. They're just more expensive, uh, uh, particularly for the person's life chances. Um, what I didn't say was that we did have... Um, a significant minority of working class parents who were offering a high home learning environment and their children had better results on entering preschool. And we did have a significant minority of middle class families offering a low home learning environment. And they did have poorer cognitive attainment at the beginning of preschool. That's why I raised the Singapore issue of um, helpers who, are less articulate and, and there's there's no um, there's no compensating for uh, creating spending time with your children and creating time to talk and engage with your children. I think social mobility is an issue for all governments, and some of the dispositions that you talked about, you know, the kind that Carol Dweck talks about, the growth mindset, the grit, the um, masterful thinking are things that we can encourage parents to do at home with their children, but they really need to be through not not a preschool type pedagogy, but getting children to getting parents to engage with uh, their children in everyday activities. You know, like when, when they're um, uh, when they're engaged with um, meal times. Um, you know, being able to um, talk about how many plates to lay out, how many chopsticks, and using mathematical words like we, uh, there, there are four chopsticks, two for you, two for me. So mathematical language comes in uh, modeling that in the same way that adults can do it in preschool. Bath time, you know, talking about bubbles and water and, you know, just engaging with children in what they're interacting with. And preschools can help parents, particularly post pandemic, um, in terms of what they can, the language they can use when they're out with their children, you know, noticing the numbers on the buses or, um, uh, uh, you know, how things work. I mean, it's interesting. Um, I've said to uh, Professor Lim before that, you know, Catherine Snow talks about the importance of 
you know, it's not the word gap that matters. It's the knowledge of the world gap. And I've said I would go further and say it's the it's the social and cultural capital as well, because if you don't know, you know, how the world functions, the buses have numbers on them. You know, how do children know? You know, how does the adult know which bus to take? But if we articulate, I know that I'm going to take bus number nine. Oh, that looks a bit like nine. No, that's a six. Uh, we're going to take the nine or the 72 bus. So that's going to be two numbers, the seven and the two. That's the bus we're taking. So children get knowledge of the world, like adults know which bus to take by the number on it. <laughs> and they know which route it takes. So if you have play routines, like um, you, you make the home corner into a travel agency, children can then make passports and they can buy suitcases from down the road and uh, they then know that to go to another country you have to plan you have to have identity documents you have to have so children can learn through books through play through routines some of those things that give them knowledge of the world and therefore thought and persistence and the kinds of things that you're talking about it happens through the curriculum but more than anything it happens through the teacher's pedagogy um, a colleague has asked, Yvonne has asked, which study is the data for uh, the quality and quantity of words? I can't remember the quantity and quality one, but I do know that it's, um, I don't know if you remember, Cyrene, uh, I do know that it's... Uh, Hart and Risley. Hart and Risley is the number of words, the Hart and Risley, that's 1995. It's the number of words, the, you know, the 50 million and the 12 million, you know, heard by four. But the quantity and qualities is a more recent study, and I can't remember the name of it. But, you know, it, it started with the Hart and Risley. Are there any other questions? Um, let me go down. Uh, I have a question. Yes, who's speaking? Uh, it's ah, Sue. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for your sharing. I think that these research findings always amaze me, especially about how children's brain develops at such a young age. So now we know that uh, children, they can learn early and they can learn a lot. And I think many preschools and parents are, are trying to ensure a very stimulating environment for young children. However, I'm starting to worry if some of them may end up hot housing children. Like I see kids uh, learning pretty advanced science concepts and learning how to do coding. Uh, some preschoolers are being sent for enrichment and, and tuitions after their preschool program. So I think I'll just like to hear your thoughts on this okay. and, and how can we avoid doing too much, avoid expecting too much from children and uh, where do we draw the line? Thank you. That's an excellent question, Sue Wen, and I've thought about it a lot because of contexts like Hong Kong and uh, Singapore, where I do a lot of work. Um, our our six-year-old's home learning environment showed uh, that some enrichment programs were positive, um, but hot housing was negative, and that um, enrichment pro allowing children to engage in expressive play. Um, was the uh, produced the highest home learning outcomes. So children were engaging in uh, playing with friends or siblings using a lot of pretend play and language. Um, I think that where we have some enrichment uh, for physical development, like swimming and playing outside, that's really good for children. But if they're doing something every single night, and it's with tutors who are teaching more didactically. This is a huge strain on children at that young age. I mean, the work I've done with um, Professor Lim and her colleagues on the uh, movement project, a very innovative project for Singapore that the university is leading through Professor Lim. Um, you know, we, we know, I've shown you how the World Health Organization Chief Inspectors of Health say that children should have, children under five, three hours of energetic play a day. And I'm worried that um, 
uh, Singaporean children don't get that. And we know that that physical activity also helps to wire and fire the brain um, as well. So I, I think that we need to try and, if we want our children to be, um, I think in, 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 in um, Chinese culture, there is a big emphasis on executive functions, which is why your children do well in school, particularly working memory. But too much of that can also lead still to unhappy children, um, children with mental health issues, children who are not physically as advanced. And I think we have to give our children, because our children are not just brains, they come with hearts and feelings and they come with bodies. And getting those things in tune for development is where they'll make the best progress. Because even if you're uh, brilliant at coding, if you can't interact with your colleagues, if you can't persuade them to uh, take your ideas on, if you haven't got persuasive talk or a playful nature that engages people, you're going to have difficulty getting your ideas across. So I think we do need um, a, 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 a emphasis on those other softer skills as people see them. So I think your question is really, really important. And that's something parents need to really think about. Our children aren't just little economic machines. You know, they, they are people who have a more full potential than just earning. Obviously, earning and living your life and being able to cope with the world is an important thing. But, you know, we can do that. The most um, creative people like Einstein um, were not just good at physics. They, they, they were good at um, social, moral and other um, things as well. Yes, thank you for sharing your perspective. I do hope the children in Singapore will get to play more, <laughs> get more of their uh, an enjoyable childhood back. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think that, yes, I just put in the chat box for everybody in case um, people aren't uh, aware yet that we have actually a Singapore integrated 24 hour activity guideline for children under seven. This is launched. It's a very good document. It's a very good document. Are there more questions for Professor Siraj? And I noticed that your next talk is on play. Um, and uh, so it's a good, good point at which to say there's more to come on that. Any other questions? Here, I just have a, uh, something to, to, I wonder, you know, um, what you might say uh, to help teachers, to encourage parents in order to interact better with their children. Because in Singapore, we often see, um, we have a big eating out culture, so dining out culture, and we often see, you know, young children seated at the table with their family, but staring at a tablet or their handphone and watching YouTube while they're eating. Um, how would you advise us to encourage adults not to do that? I think a little bit of that is okay. Um, not for children under two. But for children over two, uh, having, I think sometimes parents do need a break and they do need to take distraction activities with them. But try taking a range of things, take it in turns, like sometimes take drawing paper or a game that they can play with a sibling, or just engage them in the talk at the table. Or if you do take a tablet, have it for a fixed period of time, like when the food is, when they've eaten and you know, um, a fixed period of time, um, but not make a habit of taking it every single time. So children assume it's a time for them to engage in that. 
I think there can be a lot of talk about the food. You know, if you don't have, um, if you have a big eating out culture, you 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 could possibly also have a big unhealthy eating culture and children could learn a lot more about food and vegetables and the words related to that and how you cook that. Um, cooking with children at home is important. I mean, some of my friends in Hong Kong were telling me that, you know, there are apartments where there's no kitchen because, you know, the, the people don't, <laughs> you know, they buy the apartment and there's no kitchen because they, they you know, they, they expect people to just buy stuff from outside on the way home. And there's that big kind of a eating out culture, but throwing away plastics. And, you know, we, we're, we're all trying to change that around the world, aren't we? That um, we want to uh, be responsive to sustainability and the climate culture and things like that as well. But we also don't have sufficient research yet about children spending a lot of time in front of scre screens in terms of sight well-being and so on. So we have to think about children's health, um, but also the fact that they are human. And the first thing we need to do is to learn to be human rather than learn to be, uh, to be with human intelligence rather than artificial intelligence, because that's something we bring in as an add-on. And when children are under five, six, they haven't had enough human intelligence experience to know what is distinctive and wonderful about humanity, like talking about feelings and food and tastes and stuff like that and interacting. Because later in life, some of the problems we have of loneliness and isolation and stuff like that are largely because of these things. So I'm not anti-technology, but I think it needs to be used in an intelligent way uh, and not so much maybe with our under fives, under sixes. Hi. Are there more comments or questions? They're all welcome. And seeing that we we only have a few more minutes before we need to close, I'm not going to use the Slido. So it would be good, you know, if you have a burning question, just unmute yourself and just say hi and just ask away. Some of you are teachers, some are teacher educators, I see. Um, but I believe many of you are also parents. I was hoping parents would come. They're the most important. Sorry, teachers. <laughs> You're important too, but you know what I mean. Oh, someone has suddenly put up three questions. Oh, great. <laughs> Uh, I'm wondering if the high quality preschools in my presentation are those of high school fees. No, um, they're actually the free ones. Um, they're often provided by um, uh, uh, the, the state. Um, in, we do have, So, so we do encourage our low economic um, families to send their children there, but usually they're mixed. They've got a mix of children. Um, the study I've just been doing in Shenzhen region with my DPhil student, Runke Wang, um, has shown, is beginning to show, it's an evidence-based PD that we have, um, again, better gains in, uh, Ministry of Education supported centres than in the high fee centres. The high fee centres often uh, can have poorer quality. Um, and uh, this is a problem because parents assume that if it's high fee, it's high quality. And it might look great because, you know, everything is neat and beautiful materials, but that structural quality, the process quality that I talked about, the high quality interactions might not be so great. Um, the second question is, we recognize the importance of providing quality early years experiences, yet, as you have mentioned, we do 
have children coming from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. What is your advice to address such social equity issues? Well, it's to ensure that those centres have high quality. I mean, the, the, the issue is um, improved teacher education and professional development for teachers. And, uh, you know, a public discourse on what children need, young children need, so that there is discussion amongst the public about what quality uh, looks like, both within the home and within preschool. I also think that um, in Singapore, you have a diverse background related to ethnicity, and there is need for support in terms of gender, ethnicity, and social class in ensuring that um, everybody has uh, similar rights uh, to education and support. And finally, there's a question from Elaine on, I concur with you about the importance of developing understanding about humanity from young. What will be your advice for educators to inculcate this understanding? Uh, and I think it is a strong equalities curriculum drawing attention to girls being able to do the same as boys, having role models, you know, using storybooks where you so, show girl doctors and surgeons and plumbers, you know, we've got all those sorts of books available now. I don't know if you have sufficient numbers with Chinese, I'm always shocked at how many Western images there are in your books. There should be more local images of um, people who are Chinese, Indian, um, Malay, you know, so that then children have got a realistic understanding of their own society. And ensuring that home corner areas have play equipment that children can relate to, and that they're, they're inquisitive about from other parts of the world as well. So, you know, not just chopsticks, but knives and forks, but also, you know, um, things like, um, you know, sarongs and different types of outfits and so on. So children can ask and be inquisitive about those things and ask questions. Really, you know, for a very advanced society like Singapore, you're not producing children for Singapore, you're producing them for the world. So they need to, the world is their oyster. You have such a great economy, such a great country. You, want, you don't want to do a disservice to your kids. You want to make them world citizens. Hey, Rim, there's also a question or a yes from Nora Zim about... I've observed and evaluated many good practices in preschool lessons. I hope you could share briefly one such lesson. I, I thought I tried to do that through sustained shared thinking and process quality, the importance of interacting with your children. And I tried to pick out every single time one thing, like from all the developmental things, physical, cognitive, uh, social, emotional, I picked out language. Uh, and these aspects are particularly important. Um, getting uh, parents on board to use maths language, um, to use sci scientific language, shall we, shall we test this, um, what are your ideas, not your hypothesis, but what are your ideas about how this works. I mean, I remember one of our granddaughters when she was four, she used to draw her family, she's got a brother called Josiah, a younger, herself, her younger brother wasn't born then, and she's got her mum and dad, and she used to draw a picture of five people, there was mum, dad, Josiah, her, and Alexa. She thought Alexa was one of the family. You know, she, that's a digital voice assistant. She's seven now, and I, she drew a picture of five, but with Jonathan, her younger brother. And I said to her, where's Alexa? And she said, Alexa's not part of our family. Alexa is a program. <laughs> so children developing that in intelligence themselves through their parents talk because you know if something can talk it's a human quality you might think it's human you know uh so young children's ontologies about um you know obviously i'm interested in child development because that's that's my bread and butter how, how they perceive often they think if something moves like a little you know the dogs that used to move they think it's alive they try to feed it because it's moving like a hip. So young children haven't fully developed their ideas around artificial intelligence 
human intelligence or their ideas around what living things can do, like they can reproduce and um, move and speak. But there are now some technologies that are actually quite confusing, even for adults, um, in, in the kind of adult uh, that intelligence this, they display. So I think my biggest observation, if I want to add something new for Noor, it's that um, we really need to teach our children 21st century skills. And those are around self-regulation, you know, bits around technology and artificial intelligence and what it means to be human. That I would put right at the top because I think we're kind of losing the sense of that. Children growing up with many siblings, our research shows that up to two or three siblings is positive and then it becomes negative in terms of development if they've got more. Um, but again, that's a group uh, pattern. It doesn't, I, I come from a family of eight children, I've done okay, but you know, generally it's two or three, but you're always gonna get the outliers as well. Uh, but if, if children, if there are uh, more children, uh, encouraging the home learning environment to get siblings to read with children, to do things with children, is another way of supporting the younger children and the older children, because explaining things to less um, uh, able people, because they're younger, not because they've got less ability, takes quite a, a lot of skill. I think we must be getting towards the end now, Cyrene. I think we've gone over. Okay. We'll make that the last question then. Yes, absolutely. It is 7.30 p.m. here. And uh, what I've done is put the next lecture in the chat box so that you can all register for it. And I would really encourage you, if you're teachers, educators, to even turn it into a parent event, you know, a get together, because the next one is on a Saturday morning. Um, and you can uh, just get a few of the parents together and say, hey, there's this talk. Let's um, come for it and have a discussion after that. Right. OK, so thank you all very much for your time. Uh, have a very lovely evening. And thank you to Professor Sirach once again for sharing her precious thank time you. with us. Um, and we'll see thank you. Thank you for all your time. kind. Thank you for all your kind comments in the chat. Thank you very much. I've thoroughly enjoyed the meeting. I wish I could meet you face to face, but maybe um, I, I will visit Singapore. Love Singapore. Yes, another occasion, definitely. So be well, everyone. And we'll Thank see you. you again. Thank you very much for organizing the wonderful uh, sharing. Is We really learn a lot. And thank, thank you. you uh, yeah, Dr. Raj, nice to meet you. You are welcome Have to Singapore. <laughs> Do come and visit us. We welcome you. Thank you. Hey, hi, Jardine. Yeah. you, ma'am. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Hassan. Hi. Mm -hmm. bye, bye.